Baby, you'll be back. That looks shot. Cheers. We'll miss the train. if any of us ever get back there. It's a good idea, the four weeks, just to let you have a look round. It surprised me how it seemed to run itself all the time. No no trouble at all seemed to run no. smoothly. Yeah, they don't seem to be. Anyway. If you, I mean, if you take a company or something trouble. outside, you've got a managing director and a you know manager of this, that and the other walking around, there didn't seem to be any of that. The whole thing seemed to run quite smoothly, just with ordinary officers who knew, knew the job. And there didn't seem to be anybody going around issuing orders or anything like that. No, the, the authority did seem to be in the background, although hovering. You know, just as, as the same as I felt authority was on my shoulder all the way through this mm. four weeks. You know, somebody seemed to be watching me all the time. Mind, I felt good about this because I thought, well, if one of these blokes gets a bit funny, <laughs> <laughs> at least there's somebody around. Well, during the next four weeks here, I want you to wear these HMP badges on your lapels. Now, this tells all the staff who see you walking around that you're a prison officer under the training. Now, I've devised a program for the next four weeks. Uh, I'll go into the details more about that later on. But during your time here, you'll be put into various departments within the prison. What I want you all to do is to observe what's going on and to ask questions. Why did you want to join the prison service? Well, mainly because there wasn't very much outside. Simple as that. I see. What were you doing before? You, before? I did 25 years in the Navy, so I know no other job, you know, really. Yeah. Back to the uniform, I suppose. Yeah. How about you? Um, well, I was in the grocery business with my parents, yeah. and they decided to retire, and uh, it just wasn't cut out for me, so I decided to try the prison service. Yeah. Is that? Good. How about you? Well, I'm an electrician by trade, and 15 years as an electrician, yeah. and uh, just come back from Zambia, and I thought I'd uh, like a change. Yeah. As far as the prison service is concerned, you know, we're not a, a judge and jury. Uh, we're not the police force. Uh, some prison officers may think that we are, and this is wrong. As if it's not, is it? Uh, you know, I mean, that you can argue both ways. Wait, Sam, can you fix this machine? No, it's not like that. It's just you're watching your watch officers in. We're not in the middle. It's always a place. It's going to kind of work on you. It's about half past six in the morning. We're in that room. It's in that room. Yes, yes. And this is going to pick up. I was strolling up the road, and all of a sudden, a car came by, out of the window, poked three heads. All screws, bastards, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, yeah. Gab, how are you? Yeah. They've got it. Yeah. Always, 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 always,
Bloody hell. You're taking me in the kitchen down to Margate for the day. I only see you every other weekend as a bitch, you know. Another young ones, and we have an awful lot of youngsters in the prison. They like to be doubled up, they don't like to be alone. But the older woman, she likes privacy, she likes to be on her own. You see, they're in association all day. They work with others, they're um, in association all evening. And they just, it's the only time they can be alone. Some of us, been here five days. So, you know, how wet was his kids? How is she? Children, his wife's feeding him for meal times. And that's about all. What is she? Oh, she's doing his cooking for him. I went and saw the game. I'm all with him up and down. Well, this is Maystone reception. All inmates passing through Maystone go through here. They come through here when they're received in civilian clothes. They come through, they take it all off, strip right off, and they're provided with the prison clothing. They're also provided with all the other things they might need. Toothbrushes, shaving brushes, clothes gear, pots, anything that they might need for their time in here. Most and apart from that, it's a self-contained unit. Nearly, we're provided with food from other prisons. We've got our own works department staffed by prison officers to stop the place falling to pieces. Uh, central kitchen so providing food for the three wings. Segregation unit for our troublemakers. Hospital if anybody's sick. And what do you do with the prisoners all day? Well, all prisoners got to work, even if it's just cleaning in the wing. A number of workshops, tailor shop, print shop, nearly all government work though. Yeah. What about education? Well, the education department, very good really, they do nearly everything. They cover studies for the more intelligent men here up to open university level. Also, for the, those who can't read and write, they've got full-time studies for those as well. Has the prison its own welfare department? Yeah, it's got a full-time welfare staff, also got a full-time chaplain. And what about when they don't work? Association in the evening, and also other facilities during the day. We've got two televisions in each wing, snooker, table tennis, a swimming pool, football pitch, a well-equipped gym. Oh, it sounds like a bit of a holiday camp. Yeah. Not really, not really. We do all their thinking for them. We tell them when to get up, when to go to bed, when to eat, what to eat. We remove the right and the ability to think and act for themselves. Might be right for some, some of it used to it, but uh, certainly wouldn't suit me. There are some people here in this wing who personally I, I, I think will be very old men before they are finally released from prison. But that was one thing I would never tell them. It, it's uh, an element of kidology. How, how do you deal with a bloke like that if he is causing a bit of bother? If a man is, is reacting subversely in the wing, it often works out that an officer that he gets on with, an officer that he knows uh, and has a working relationship with, can often go to that man and have a natter to him and talk him round. Because always at the back of their mind, they have this feeling, I've got to tell the line, you know, generally speaking, otherwise I'm, gonna, I'm never going to get out of this place. Uh, he might verbal off, uh, you know, uh, abuse an officer or, or shout and, and hustle in the wing, but this is purely short term. It, it, it's a reaction that perhaps he, he thinks he's got to make or his friends think he's got to make over a specific issue. But really, when the heat's died down, he'll more than likely come up and say, look, I didn't really mean that, you know, uh, just at the moment sort of thing. And, and it's all forgotten. But if that man was placed on report for that, for, for doing that, and put in front of the governor for disciplinary action, the relationship between me or, or the inmate or an officer and the inmate that, who was involved goes back two or three months. So, so because the they're doing life, they get away with a lot more than no, I'm not somebody saying they, who's doing a short term? No, I'm not saying they get away with it. In actual fact, the rules apply exactly the same to a man doing life as to a man doing, say, a short term six months. The rules are there, but the interpretation of them is open for a more serious look with a man doing life in prison. Because we've... Yes, come in. Change. Where to now then? 
anywhere but now on the train. Well, we had this little chat, didn't we, a month ago? And I said at the time, we can't spare you off the cleaners. We're running fairly tight now. And uh, as and when we can afford to let you go, we, we, we will seriously consider a move for you. But at the time being, we're running tight and, and I can't afford to let you go. As easy as that. Yeah, well, surely there must be someone else who wants to clean this job. Well, there are, but there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people that we don't want on the cleaners. Why not? Well, that's, that's my... That's One's as good as enough. No, it's the other. Well, that's purely your opinion. Unfortunately, I'm in charge of cleaners and you're not. Yo, how soon will I get this kind of Well, we'll we'll have a chat later on. I'm a bit busy at the moment, but uh, as I say, as and when I can spare you, I'll seriously consider letting you go. Like a month ago. Well, maybe next month. Maybe the month after that. But uh, my priority is is the wing. And you're a reasonable worker, you do your job well, and I'm reluctant to let you go. Of course I am. I'm not going to cut my nose off to spite my face, am I? No, I don't know. Well, I'm not. And uh, as and when I can spare you, I'll let you go. But uh, for the time being, you plod on. And as I'm a bit busy, if you plod on right now, and uh, we'll have a NASA later on and uh, see if we can work something out. Right. Okay. Uh, where was I? I lost my drift. This is a trouble when you get people coming in and out. It throws you. It right was. Off. It was something to do with um, um, bending the rules a little more for life. Yeah. Well, we don't bend the rules. Uh, when you say no or I want this done, you find yourself saying why you want it done. Like the bloke that just came in. Well, typical example. Yeah. Five or six years ago, it would have been sufficient to say no, no labour change. But today, that's not sufficient. This man is doing, doing a, a life sentence, so he, wants to, he thinks someone's having a pop at him. So yeah. you say, well, and you explain yourself, you know, and, and then he goes away reasonably happy, and I'm happy because I've stopped him having his labour change, and he's gone away with a little illusion of grandeur thinking, well, well you know, what well, a good I must be good at my job. Yeah. You know, uh, perhaps he'll give me a good job when he does let me go. In an establishment like this, where men are doing um, long sentences, the, the major ball games, say like football, for example, then if things are going bad, then uh, you know, these chaps, being as they are, are reluctant to accept the responsibility for things going wrong as being theirs, and, and they want a scapegoat. You know, if a particular team is losing, then uh, they're losing because um, the centre forwards in the pay of the opposition, or the referees bent, or, or something like this. <laughs> yeah, this this is this yeah, is it. I can see this um, then uh, we find that, as instructors, you've got to be constantly aware that because things are going well for six months or a twelve months, at any time, subject to pressures on the individual, either in the prison or, or from outside, family matters. Then a, a chap who's been really enthusiastic because of these other pressures can so just suddenly stop stuff. coming. Yeah, yeah. and you don't see him. Yeah. I mean, we've had uh, one particular instance. You know, it's a classic as far as I'm concerned from my own experience. Uh, a chap was coming down to this gymnasium for weight training for 12 months, and he never even spoke to any of the instructors. He came down for his session. He did his session. He just went, but there was no communication. Yeah. And this was over a 12-month period. And then he begins to get interested. He begins to think about competing and achieving awards. So he's got to use the, the, the P staff. However, later on, you know, um, the, I was refereeing at the time, you know, uh, a referee, again, that went against him, a decision went against him. He wouldn't accept this. And you're right back to square one where he's not talking. Yeah. But then again, you've still got to be prepared so that if he does come again, it's no good bearing malice. You cannot afford in an establishment like this to bear malice. This is why, PE-wise, we, we, we try not to get too involved in the, the offence that uh, an inmate is serving his time for. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. let's face it, we're the instructors, we're human as well. You know, to, 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 to be aware of some of the diabolical things these blokes are doing time for, and then to be making every effort to ensure 
that is, is fit well and happy, uh, you know, there could be possibly a clash there. So that we, we don't, we take the chap as he is in the gym situation. Do you find the relationship is different because you're not wearing a uniform? No, I mean, the tracksuit is a uniform. Uh, no matter how um, we feel about this, we are still prison officers. I mean, this is a real system. I think it's important to, to continue to understand that we're on one side of the fence and they're on the other. Because no matter what your relationship is with the inmate, as prison officers, we can never really understand what it's like to be serving time. Because, you know, we're not locked up in a cell all the night. At nine yeah. o'clock, half past nine, whatever finishing time is, we're off with all family to completely different surroundings. We're there here to stay. They've got to associate with, with people who they don't particularly want to associate with. We've got this freedom of choice. They have not Well, at the training school, you'll be taught the, the correct methods. You'll be taught the rules. You'll be taught the department's instructions. You'll be told this is the way in which you will conduct A situation or B situation. You'll be told this. But then you come up against the big problem of when you go to, uh, or you're posted to a prison or a borstal, of the interpretation at that establishment of the rules. And it may well differ vastly from what you've been told. Because various governors have, have very, very extreme uh, views on things. Some comply with the rule book, others don't. Others don't even have it in the drawer. They, uh, they don't even refer to it. The prison service over the last ten years at least has, along with society, been changing. Uh, some would think for the worst. Uh, I would be one of those who would think that. In my view, personal view, which isn't shared by a lot of people, uh, is that as near as damn it one should stick to these rules. It's nothing unpleasant to abide by a, a rule of the prison. It's nothing unpleasant to tell someone that they can't do this because it's not allowed. Uh, and therefore, I don't see any problem. One needn't argue about it. One needn't have a confrontation about it. One can just create the situation in prison where everybody understands what, what has to happen, inmates and staff, and then let's get on with it. So all this paint stuff here. That's uh, my painting, you know, that's, you know, when I, I get phases, you know, when I start painting and when I don't paint, you know. Yeah, you've got permission for it then. Oh, yeah, I've got permission for it, yeah. You got permission for all that? This whole box is it for that thing? Yeah, full of tubes. <coughs> <coughs> I thought there was a a new instruction about that that there was only supposed to be small quantities, not uh, well. This is what we got there. Like from you know, something Wandsworth, which I brought with me, and. Um, the rest, you know, I've just accumulated, you know. What's you this know, paint? This paint, which uh, I... You know, actually. No thinners, then? No thinners, no, no, it's just emulsion paint. Oh, we'll leave it here for the time being anyway, Pat, and um, we'll check it up. Yeah, we'll have to check on this, you realise that, don't you? Yes, I am. I certainly wouldn't like all my letters, Rick. But well, neither would I, uh, neither would most people, but when you're in, when you're in a prison situation, uh, this censoring must be done. Uh, there is also mainly the, as the aspect of the security nature. Yeah, but they, they get visits and things. Surely they can say anything Yeah, this is true. Up. They also try and get what we, we term in the trade as stiffs, illicit letters out. And also they try and sometimes, they try and get a message through to a person who, to whom they're not writing through an official letter. So we have to do this. Um, also the same, through incoming mail, a man may get the Dear John from his wife. Dear John. Uh, the letter saying that she's found another chap while he's been away. Mm. Also the fact that one of the kids may, got, may have been hurt in a road accident. And these sort of things, the human relationship side of the uh, 
uh, sanction side is very important because we find that if a man receives this letter, he might be a normal, everyday, happy-go-lucky type of bloke, and then all of a sudden, bang, he goes the other way. Yeah, I hadn't and, thought about this side. And we do so. this, we, when we get these letters, we inform all the other members of staff in the wing, or in the case, it may even be a shop instructor. We phone him up and say, look, old Charlie Jones has had, his, had a dodgy letter this morning, watch him this afternoon, he may be a little bit touchy. Touchy, yeah. and, um, you know, it saves, it saves a lot of trouble between the inmate himself and yeah. us, and also the other inmates around him, you know, if we know that he's got one or two close friends, we'll say to him, well, look, old so-and-so's uh, missus has uh, written in to say that she doesn't want to know him when he goes out, mm. you know, watch him for a couple of days. But usually you'll find that they get over this quite quickly, you know, they sort of accept it after a while because it was part of their sentence. This is one of the, yeah. the hazards of Being prison inside, life, you know. Yeah. A man comes to me, he doesn't go to the welfare officer or to the doctor or to the officer, he comes to a chaplain because he's about to cry his eyes out and he cries his eyes out in that chair. Well, part of, I think, the culture of the Christian priesthood is to listen to him, to sympathise with him, not to agree with him always, but to regard him as a person and let him cry, never letting him down by telling those outside. I've seen tough guys out of Kent come in here swaggering in to see the chaplain crying their eyes out, telling me all sorts of intimate things, and then swaggering out again, keeping the image which they know about on the wing. Now, that's the job of a priest in prison. I wouldn't seek to justify it. I think the work of a priest is to be where there's need, where people are at need. If he's a Christian or, as I say, the Church of Turkey, it doesn't really matter to me. What does matter is that one is able to keep alive this breaking or broken spirit and perhaps in a sense to resurrect him, or would that be too religious a word to use? Well, wearing what you are is exactly the word to use, I suppose. And I think it's not only the chaplain's role, but it's the officer's role as well, to persuade, cajole, whatever, this particular person to see himself as he really is, not as he pretends to be. And something of prison can do that. It can make him a new man, I think. On the other hand, it, it, it can be broken by his own culture or by going off the officers. That he, he will always dislike an officer as he dislikes a policeman. So what you are really is sort of a half welfare officer and a half psychologist. Oh, neither a psychologist nor a welfare officer. There's a different ministry. The welfare officer sees the person as his client. The doctor sees his, the person or the inmate, to use that word, as a patient. Um, the psychologist also as a patient, but the priest sees the person as, to use a very old word, soul, as a soul. And by virtue of this, he doesn't treat him as a patient, client, uh, or sort of a professional relationship. He identifies with the person. He cries with him when he cries. He laughs with him when he laughs. He holds his hand sometimes, like that, in order that he might be himself catching on to the, say, his wife or mother's died, or the child's died. One of the tragedies of prison is helplessness. The man is utterly helpless. And this is the, is the extent of the punishment as far as I see it. To be there, unable to phone up, perhaps not to write. And this is, this begins to break him. He feels like a thing instead of being the person. And he becomes depersonalized. But if, uh, if there is an officer there, who has a kind word, uh, not a sentimental extrovert sort of behavior, always being kind to him, but a genuine response to the inmate as a person-to-person -person thing. Then this um, thingness about him um, tends to go away, and he sees so, his so place in society, place in the society of the wing. Yeah. So would you say yeah. the landing officer that opens the cell first thing in the morning has to try and be? the welfare officer, the chaplain, uh, yeah. the you psychologist. See, he hasn't to try to be anything. He's got to be a person. He's got to be a genuine bloke who is a can I Can I interrupt a minute? Yeah. With this attitude that you know, we're building up here, what you just said and what you just said, mm. surely we're getting away from the purpose of putting a man in prison in the first place. What is it's that supposed purpose? to be a deterrent, isn't it? A deterrent? Of some nature. 
I mean, they've done away with what was classed as the ultimate deterrent. I think he comes to prison because his neighbours feel he ought to. Well, that's he, exactly right. Because yeah. he's made mistakes. He's broken into a bank or he's clobbered an old lady and he ought to be in prison because he's done that. He's a naughty boy. Yeah. But once he's got into prison, it's then that we can start. Uh, one, that he mustn't deteriorate and become a thing, as we talked about. But on the other hand, I, I think that prison is a place where he can learn and grow, even though it's said that he can't. Yes, but uh, does it work? Sometimes it does. But surely we're not here to mollycoddle them, you know, I mean, they have, they have done something wrong against society and we're here to, to sort them out. I don't mean we should go around kicking them or anything, but, you know, the, the theme we've got on to by talking like this and saying mm. that we help them here and you've got to be, the, the landing officer's got to do this and do that. I think that the landing officer has to be himself. He has his own ideas of, he, he, does, he keeps the rules, um, he unlocks the man, uh, he sees that he's fed and watered, as it were, but it's more than that. Anything that he tries to pretend to be, the man knows. Cons are very able to see a man that's genuine and understand genuineness, and they have their own nicknames for officers, and they have for chaplains as well. But, uh, <laughs> um, but what I'm saying is that if the prison officer is himself, you see, it's far easier to make a gentle man hard than to make a hard man gentle. But sometimes you have the sort of military image, the officer who bends his cap like that and stands. I saw an officer the other day opening and closing a gate for a, the wife of one of the inmates that I'd seen, a little frail little soul going out with a kitty. And this officer turned the key, opened the door, looked at me, looked at this poor little girl who sort of crept out through the door like that, and then bang the door and locked it. I couldn't do a thing. He did his job, he opened and locked answered. the door. Yeah. That's all he did. He still haven't arrogant so and so he was. He still haven't answered my question about, does it work? Because yeah, you see the prison population rising all the time. Does this um, new approach really work? Or I don't it? think it's a new approach. I've known men who are many years experience in the service who have a sort of innate gentleness about them. And at times of crisis, they can be very helpful to an inmate. For instance, if you inform an inmate that uh, his mother has died, and you do so at five past nine at night when most of the, or all the inmates are locked up, and only a few officers there, we can go and get this inmate, bring him down, having told him that there's tragedy in the family. And it's the big burly screw, the officer, who says, come on, son, they'll be all right, gives him a cup of tea. Now here is a very formalized, uh, very traditional officer doing the job of a father. Isn't this what an officer is sometimes? In other words, he has the ability to change his roles, to be firm and stern, and at the same time to be kind and accepting. And then there will be your visit to the local prison at Canterbury. Totally different regime from here. Tomorrow you'll be going to the Borsal, a different regime again. For a kick-off, the staff there were civvies. No doubt they'll be taking you around the farm. We get our milk from there. I'm not sure how big it is, but it's a pretty big place. Well, the farm extends down to the fence there, along the bottom where the motorway is, down towards the motorway bridge there. It's about 240 acres in all. And then you've got the, the farm buildings behind, uh, the piggeries and the cattle, the cattle stables. So it's quite a good-sized farm altogether. The motorway there, that's the M2, which leads up to London. Um, on outside parties, you know, you've just got to accept that there will be people absconding and that, that is the way they go when they do go. You're going you know. back fairly soon? Oh yeah, men are generally within 24 hours, most of them. And most of you boys from the London area? That is our main catchment area, yeah, it's south-east. But uh, London's got the, and the biggest population. And I about working on a farm when they come from London? In summer, they love it, really lap it up, you know. In winter time, they're not over fond, you know, it's a bit cold, but uh, it goes for the officers as well, you know, I like it in summer, but not in this weather. That's the hospital and medical centre on your left. Serious cases, of course, go to outside of hospitals, we're just there for minor ailments. The walls here are smaller than there would be in a prison like Maidstone, as you've noticed. We've got five wings here. C wing's the new wing, brand new wing, opened about four years ago. And B, D and E wings are the old cellular types, probably like you get at Maidstone. 
And the A-wing, which we're going to go to now, is uh, unique in itself because it's a dormitory type yeah. with um, four dormitories, each holding about 20, 24 lads. Yeah, the boys here are from 15 years old to 21 years of age on the date of sentence. And what kind of role do you find yourself playing? Uh, with boys, you've got to be everything. Uh, you're their family link, you know, you're the mother, the father, the brother, sister, everything. You find it difficult to get on with them? No, some just don't want to know you and they never will. And others will, will come forward to you, you know. Yeah. Have right you got them all the age groups all together in the one dormitory? Yeah. 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 Well, Do you get any problems? Well, no, no, no problems really. I mean, they work in themselves. Do the boys graduate from the cells to the dormitories? No, they're only sent in when there are vacancies. They just come in normally. So I bet it's chaos in here at night time. It's not too bad, actually. The lads run the dormitories themselves. Uh, most of them want to go to bed at lights out, and uh, so they rule. Would you rather work in a prison or a barstool? Well, I didn't choose to come here, but um, I was sent here, as you'll be posted. But now I'm here, I'd like to stay with the lads. Let me have a good old quiet train in prison. By talking to these blokes, you know, there's some entirely different places. You know, these uh, yeah. cat seas, which just have a wire net around and no the school, they ran security down your throats. And they're right, of course. The type of security differs from place and to I place. And I found that in all the seven prisons I've done, that the job starts and finishes on the landing. Only minor things, but to a con, they're a lot. A spoonful of sugar to a con is a lot. I've seen men literally fight over a spoonful of sugar on a hot plate. Something, but if you spilt it, you just sweep it up outside and throw it away. But to a man in prison, these things mean a lot. There's a large grey area where you use your own initiative when mm. talking to a man. One man might need a short, sharp word. Yeah. Another one will probably uh, need a little bit more guidance. There are many boring jobs uh, in the prison service. Um, for instance, you take being in a workshop all day, something like our carpenter shop here. I mean, you're standing there, and all you're doing is watching the men work, counting them in, counting them out, rubbing them down as they go in. In a weekday, of course, uh, they go to work 8 o'clock, uh, come back lunch 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock they go back to work, and at 5 o'clock they're banged up until 6, half past 6, and then we uh, have association right the way through then until 9. You can be on a landing on your own with 20, 30 or 40 prisoners, and if you haven't got some sort of relationship with them, how can you control them? You have to aim for control by relationships. Uh, control through respect. Uh, some prison officers would laugh at this and say, well, uh, there's always the book, you can always put people on the report, but okay, you can do this, but you, 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 you can't get away with it forevermore. You've got to relate in some way or other. This is the punishment point, better known as the block, where a prisoner would come and do his CC. CC is that's confinement to cell and loss of privileges. After, if you'd like to go first, after you've been adjudicated on by the governor or the board of visitors. This is punishments for what sort of thing? Uh, Offences against good order and discipline, abusive language, this type of thing, drugs, having drugs, etc. Yeah. You get yeah. much drugs? Quite a bit, yes. Mm -hmm. This is the segregation part of the wing, we go up here now. Does the governor deal with this sort of thing, then? No, he deals with the minor offences, the board of visitors with the more serious offences. Uh, this is the segregation wing, yeah, where the Rule 43 is aroused. Uh, they're up here for good order and discipline or for their own protection. What, from other prisoners? Sort of from thing? other prisoners, yes, yeah. that's right. But what's the function of the works department inside the prison? Well, it's uh, responsible for the maintenance uh, of uh, all the buildings inside the prison responsible for electrical and mechanical maintenance and also for the prison officers quarters outside yes because i was thinking of um moving over onto the electrical side myself yeah well you've got to obviously wait to get finish your training off on the discipline side and then you move over onto the uh, works, works department mm -hmm. you then carry on and do three years as a tradesman and then you're eligible to sit the Engineer 2 examination. Yes, and what does this entail, the... The, the exam, well, that usually takes, it takes two days. You do a building construction, building drawing, uh, electrical and mechanical, and um, theory, and also do you do a practical test also on most trades. I've shown you the dental room, x-ray room, the treatment room. 
I think that's about it, really. We're pretty well equipped. We can do more or less anything we need to do in this place. Yeah, quite surprising. Mm -hmm. Have you, in fact, been a hospital officer ever since you joined the prison service? No, for the first four years, I was on discipline. Yeah. But then I, I came on the Excuse hospital Excuse me, Mr. Cavender, you want it on the phone? Hello. Hello. You've nearly finished your tour of the hospital, yeah. I think, now? just about. Do you find any particular problem in, in uh, dealing with patients because they're prisoners? No, I don't think so. I think that one is always aware of the security aspect, you know, uh, in dealing with inmates. Uh, but in the hospital, um, they are treated as hospital patients. Are these cells? These are the hospital rooms which we, uh, on, on admission, the patient would go into. You must realise that, uh, that in the prison situation, um, we, we get disturbed inmates um, and uh, possibly violent inmates and therefore one can't initially use a ward uh, always and mm -hmm. therefore the room is an ideal observation point in deciding how they are going to be dealt with. Of course it's different for you blokes now and a lot better I would think. I was six months before I got to the school. I joined on a Wednesday. They gave me a uniform on a Thursday stick and whistle on Friday and Saturday and Sunday I had about 20 PS men, penal servitude, um, an execution shed and two condemned cells to look after. Mm -hmm. Monday I went to the Assizes, Tuesday I went to Stafford on escort and Wednesday I stood in a mailbag shop for the first time and faced 200 angry men sewing mailbags. Silent labour and all the business that goes with it. Please just come to the gate, please. Thanks, Arthur. Hang on a minute. This young man's just uh, joined us. This is Arthur Preston. He's in the house. What are you doing here? Uh, I came on an exchange basis as in service training. Um, I exchanged with another officer from here. Uh, I work at a detention centre. It's a long time since I've been to a prison. It's nice to get back to see how prisons work again. I think every prison is an individual establishment, really. Uh, people say, oh, we don't let that go on at Brixton. But Brixton is Brixton. Maidstone is Maidstone. But despite that fact, of course, we have still got the same guidelines laid down here and set elsewhere. Uh, but uh, some people tend to take a more relaxed view than others. But uh, I'm one of those that tries to keep as much discipline as possible. And I'm on the black side, you might say, as far as some inmates are concerned, in point of fact that um, I can be classed as a bastard because of the fact that I've probably got more men up in front of the governor during the course of a, a month than the other staff have. But uh, despite this fact, uh, I am fair on that score, and uh, all the inmates appreciate that and uh, accept the fact that if I Mr. Long Nixon, Mr. Long Nixon, and that's the end of it. And were the differences in, in opinions with the with the staff. Does the system work here? Let's put it this way, we don't get any very dodgy situations at most, and which is a good thing I think from staff point of view because it helps you do your job in a much nicer way if such a thing is possible yeah. but uh, you know I mean it's not a very pleasant job but if we can keep it running smoothly by let no aggravation because of the system we run let's carry on you know yes. I'm, uh, I'm all for it yes. but as I say there are things which I personally just can't let go, and when I when I don't, I you know take the necessary action and put them in front of the governor, and the governor sorts it out. I suppose you had certain expectations uh, before you came, though, didn't you? You know, you really were had certain images of what the job was going to be like. I was very surprised at the lack of discipline. Yes. Mm -hmm. When I walked through the gates, it seemed to everybody seemed to be walking about. By discipline, you mean you were surprised at the lack of marching about and yes. uh, regimentation yeah. and so on, mm. yes. I, I, that's very understandable, I think. Um, uh, I think most, most people uh, have an image of prisons as a bit like the army marching about and so on. Uh, maybe this is what somehow represents the needs of society, as opposed to what prisoners need, because um, one of the real difficulties about, um, about prisons, in fact, is that in, in a way, they fulfil very many functions, you see. And I think this is the thing you're going to have to live with it, I, I, as prison officers, because in some ways you, you represent for society and carry for society, if you like, a, um, a, a very complex kind of uh, dynamic, a very complex set of feelings get somehow pushed into prison officers. You know, society needs, first of all, to punish people. 
You see, in a way, prisoners represent the badness in society. In other words, society doesn't want to know. That, yes, in a, uh, providing, you see, like I don't want to know the badness in me, but so, sooner or later I have to face it, and sooner or later society has to face the fact that prisoners do come back into society. They are ordinary people. They have got families. They are fathers to children. Or they are uh, some mother's son. The stress of the job, I think, for me, uh, became very marked. Uh, when as a prison officer, I had my first experience uh, when prisoners' families were coming to see them with their children. And it was the... somehow the normality and the abnormality of this situation that hit me. Yeah. The awful stress of it, that they, they were ordinary kids, ordinary mums and dads, ordinary wives. Uh, occasionally you'll see the situation where uh, kids almost reject their dads. Well, I've actually experienced this. In fact, being in the service as long as I was, and being away for about two years in the Navy, and then coming home and meeting my children, and then not knowing whether they should come to me or not. You know, really. Uh, and it is most upsetting. Well, see, in a way, that's one of the qualities you bring to the job. Uh, and uh, you, because you know what it feels like inside. So, in a very real way, you've shared what one of these men must feel. Yes, but surely you must have to set up some kind of barrier. Because if you thought like that all the time, you'd surely become a nervous wreck. <laughs> Absolutely. Way. But over and above this, there's a sense in which you can relate to people as people nevertheless. And that's, yeah. the, in some ways, the professionalism of the job, really. What happens when, when somebody really steps out of line, when they're causing some sort of trouble? These men are, are brought into the adjudication room, and it's a very formal atmosphere. A charge is read out to them. Uh, they either admit or deny the charge. Then you, as the officer, will give your evidence. You'll say exactly what happened. And then I shall ask the prisoner if he understands it, and then ask him to say what he uh, believes happened. And the legal kind of processes are not dissimilar to what you'd hear in a magistrate's court. Once the man has uh, had his opportunity to say his piece and to make mitigation, then I will decide. And there are a number of things that are available to me. Uh, I can lock him up for three days in, um, in confinement. So he'll be on his own, locked up for three days. I, in fact, can take remission from him, which means he'll, he will have to stay in prison that much longer. In fact, I can stop his privileges. I can stop uh, a certain amount of his pay. Not bread and water or anything? Not bread and water, no. Bread and water has, was done away with some very long time ago now. Prisoners tend, in fact, to accept the, the method by which a prison can operate. They know that. They know what can go on, and they accept it. Uh, uh, and they, they work, if you like, by the unwritten code. Well, you do not think the, the stiff sentence early on in the criminal life, because I, I would say that the majority of inmates come from, come up through the yes. system, don't they? A large number do. You, know, you have to bear in mind that some of the men you're dealing with, in fact, uh, not a, a, an insignificant proportion, are people that are on the borderline between criminality and mental disturbance. Uh, but you see, many people that come into prison have been treated harshly. Uh, what you're doing, in a sense, quite rightly, is representing some of the feelings in society that what we should do is treat people harshly. But all the evidence available to us shows that there is no relationship between harsh treatment and change in people when they go out. Yes, but you get the other side with the disappointments when they keep coming back. I don't think I can ever remember any officer recriminating with a prisoner about coming back. Because it's unprofessional. Yeah. That's the choice he's made in his life. And what we have to deal with is the man as he is there with us. Uh, all yeah. the goodness about him, all the badness. Do you prefer to work with people like this who are in for a long, long time? Yes, I do. I really enjoy it. By virtue of the fact it's most interesting, you really get to know them well. And of yeah. course they get to know us as well. Yeah, yeah. You see, if you can imagine that I've been in this room almost two years, and by far the majority of these inmates were here when I came. So you see, you can, you can in fact strike up a relationship with these people. Yeah. You this, get to know them very well. This place is, is different to all the other wings. It's um, more enclosed, more modern than all of the other wings. All the yes. other wings are all yes. big lanyards and so on.
it has its problems. It's very much more difficult to run. You see... Excuse me, what's uh, oh, Mr. Mr. Malafi about my... Uh, Stuka Q? Well, I saw a notice on the board the other day saying that you, your, your, your snooker queue was up for sale. And I thought it was rather odd. It's not true, presumably. Of course it's not. I didn't think it was. I didn't think it was. I was just trying to put you right. Never mind. OK. Yes, it does have its problems. We have to have two. We don't have one vantage point, you see, on the, in this wing. Therefore, we have to have two officers on each landing to watch what's going on, of course. What happens to people like this when they're in for a long, long time? You know, I can just imagine the, the sex problem. I'd go mad after about a couple of years, you know. Well, a couple of weeks come to that. <laughs> if I could have a pound for every time I've been asked that question, I'd be a very rich man. It is a problem, of course. Hundreds of girly magazines, masturbation. But homosexuality goes on, of course, illegally, but it does go on. Um, these men do strike up relationships with other men. It does happen. What happens then if you look through the peephole and you, you see something like that going on? Do you just sort of close it down and wander away? Oh, no, no. This is something that we would never do. You see, you've got to remember that there are sexual criminals, you see, that they're all here to be protected, mm. and others have to be protected from them. Yeah, you've, you've got, you've got young people and old yes, people as well. Yes, we have. So we would never turn a blind eye. Mm. How did you feel when you first when you first had to lock somebody up? There's something that's worried me, you know. Quite Sooner dreadful. or later, I'm going to have to slam that door. And quite dreadful, quite dreadful. But I'll give you a little tip. It's the way you bang someone up, the way you lock the door. We all tend to slam doors when we're at home, but slam a door on the prisoner when you're locking him away for the night. He's got all night in there thinking about it. He may be depressed. You would have problems with him in the morning. No, it's the way you do this, the way you bang him up. Each wing has an assistant governor like myself. I have responsibility to the governor for the smooth running of this wing. Quite simply, I'm the wing manager. This wing, of course, is different than the other wings in this prison because it is, first and foremost, a long-term wing. Out of a total of 102 inmates, 65 are serving life sentence. Uh, we have young lifers, just barely past 21 years of age, who are perhaps served three years of their sentence. We have lifers approaching middle age, approaching old age, who may have served 15, 16 years of their sentence. Uh, this, we have to have a certain ability to reach these people. Uh, they rely a great deal on relationships between the officers and themselves. When they do have an element of trust in you, it's extremely important that you provide the time to talk to them. For example, if, I, if I'm writing a report mid-afternoon or mid-morning and a lifer wants to see me, I make a point of always seeing him, irrespective of how urgent that report is. Because we are dealing with human beings and uh, relationships are more important than pieces of paper. And uh, it may be that the problem he's got is a very, very minor one, which could easily be dealt with by, the, by an officer on the landing. But for some reason, he wants the assistant governor to deal with it. It's important that you do so. Mm -hmm. It's important that you give him the time. It's important that he feels that he is being looked on as an individual. Um, for my part, I sometimes have to, have to tell a lifer who may have served 16 years of his sentence that he has again been refused parole. Uh, he may blow up here, he may start swearing at me, he may just collapse in a chair in a state of shock. He then leaves my office. That's me finished. The responsibility then for dealing with this man rests with the landing officers. And I'm also aware of their job because I spent five years as an officer before I got promoted to assistant governor. I'm, I'm aware of the tantrums the man is liable to throw on the landing. I believe it's comforting for the officers to know that I was an ex-officer because I understand their problems. Mm -hmm. My first day in the landing, uh, it was a local prison, and in the corner cell there was a man doing life imprisonment. Well, for me, life imprisonment was something that I'd read about in the paper. <coughs> so I spent, you know, in, in fact, looking back, I must have looked ridiculous because I kept passing by this man's cell, and I kept looking in because I was expecting to see something so completely different than the average prisoner. Yes. But of course he wasn't. Do you never really find yourself thinking if, if, if one comes in with a really terrible offence. Does it never really affect the way you think about that person? No. 
No. Every prisoner is the same. Uh, you, you, you consciously don't let his offence prey on your mind because you're dealing with a human being who has a problem and it's your job to deal with his problem. Yeah. You have, of course, to uh, consider his offence when you're doing things like parole reports or, mm -hmm. or hostile reports or, you or any parole. kind of report. What actually is parole? Well, quite simply, parole is release. One example, I, I told a man recently that he'd been granted parole, the man had served 12 years of a life sentence. He sat down and he asked the most straightforward questions. In fact, I was absolutely amazed at how calm he was. And then the following day he came in and said, what did we talk about yesterday? Because he'd forgotten every word of it. Mm. You know, and uh, the job has its good points, you know, and uh, a lot, the good points certainly outweigh the bad points. You're, you're not, I don't want you to have the wrong impression that I'm forever telling people bad news. I'm not. Mm. The job is frustrating because when you leave the gate in the evening, there, you really can't see an end product for your, work, your day's work. But at the same time, it can be very satisfying. Uh, you deal with a lot of troubled people, <laughs> some who are saying, wait till I get you outside the gate. But every time in my experience, I've met an ex-prisoner outside the gate, they have gone out of their way to say hello yes. and tell you how they're getting on because you are a familiar face. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're perhaps the only familiar face they know in that area. I think the hostel's a good idea, though, don't you? Oh, I think that's excellent. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> just imagine having to, to um, get a bloke ready for going outside after he's been in there for a long time. Right, now, this hostel is a bit different from any other hostel in the country, in as much as I'll uh, tell you when we get through here. Now, this is the kitchen where they do their cooking. As the cook, yeah. he's the next man to start work on the hostel. Okay? Now, uh, I told you that it's different from any other hostel in as much that this place is run by three ex prison officers. And we man this place 24 hours a day, the three of us. We do it between us. See? But all hostels have the same object, though. And that object is to get the blokes ready for outside after a long term in prison all these fellows have done four years or more. Yeah. When I tell you that we've had a fellow in here that was 24 years in prison at one stretch, he's, you, he's got to get himself adapted to outside conditions. There's all sorts of things. Imagine what it's like after 24 years in Nick. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know what it's like. I did four years as prisoner of war. Yeah. So I know what it's like. Yeah. So we understand quite a few of their problems. And believe you me, they have got problems. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. I consider it the most difficult period of man's imprisonment. Yeah. Because he's so near and yet so far away from release. He's got to work alongside of a man outside, on a bench. And that fellow can go to a dance tonight. But the fellow on the inmate of this hostel, we can't go to a dance. He's got to be in by half past ten. Yeah. How long before his actual release has he come in here? Six months. Comes in here six months before his release. He. Uh, that's six months, unless he gets parole. Yeah. yeah. I've got a man in here, just a present. 18 years in prison. Goes out tomorrow. Ten years ago, that man would have gone out with about four pounds in his pocket. He's going out with over half a pound, which he's saved, he's worked for. He's worked 12 hours a day. This is, in fact, from his earnings? That's from his earnings. Same. He's saved it. Yeah, yeah. And they got a very, very difficult job to, uh, well, get used to outside. There's traffic. I, I haven't got used to the traffic yet. Are you used to it? No, no, no. Well, no, they no, are. Yeah. Yeah. And they've got to get used to it. This man that we had for 24 years, he was like a baby. Mm. We had to take it. He never even knew the wind blew. And obviously he didn't. He's been behind a big wall. Yeah. Okay? Sheltered. He's never looked in a straight line. You look in the prison there, and what does he do? He goes round corners for exercise. Round corners. He can't walk any further than about 50 yards in one direction. Yeah. He's got to turn a corner. Yeah. He goes down the main street in Maidstone, and he's got a street of about, what, 500 yards. And he's tired before he gets out of him, psychologically. He's affected. He's yeah, he's, he's worth it. Yeah. yeah. I must well, admit, I never thought of it that well, way. Well, the radio you expect a bloke to go straight if he can't look straight. 